Hello. I'm Alex Maya from Technical Marketing, so I do see a lot of you know familiar faces, some are new. Uh, last time I was up here, I brought some hardware, and uh, we actually had somebody come up here and do the whole unplugging of it. So I brought hardware again for you guys to see. So the demo we're going to show is pretty quick, but it's going to give you an idea of uh, the value that Silver Peak brings in into this whole automation part, right? So the demo I'm going to cover is the RMA. This is a totally new feature for us, so you guys are getting a little bit of a new treat. You know, not a lot of folks know about this, um, but um, I think after today, they're gonna start noticing, you know, what we were really talking about. Um, so these two boxes are the ones that I have in part of my demo here. Um, what it, I wanted to ask, how many of you guys have gone through the RMA process of, you know, getting a RMA done for your router? I mean, how long does that take you? Quite a bit of a while, right? It's a, it's a lengthy process. You gotta go in there, write down some IP address numbers, back up the actual configuration. So what we're trying to do is actually um, help you out a bit on that. Um, you know, we know that the, the actual branch router does take a bit of time. So we could see that we do the management of the IP addresses that we're going to write down, the backup, power down, disconnect. Uh, Damien, I was mentioning, you know, the whole analogy about the phone where you got to download some of that data, upload it. It takes a while for us to be able to do something like this. And then you're going to be actually prone to some error. I mean, you do have that possibility. You're going to probably mess up something you know, in between. What we're going to try to do is help you out a little bit in that regard, and that is to show you what we're doing to avoid a lot of that and to actually expedite the process when a branch router actually goes down, you need to arm it. Um, what do you do? So, you know, we have certain customers that have cold spares, right, available to them, and they bring them up. They have already the account name, the serial number, it's already registered with Silver Peaks Cloud Portal. So we know that it belongs to that particular customer, and it shows up as an appliance discovered, ready to be deployed, right? So what I'm going to do is actually kind of go through that process. What would happen you know, if you had to go in and actually replace an actual router going through the RMA process, right? Where we just go in, put in this new router, and then it starts taking over, right? And basically what we do is just do a one pass. It goes in analyzes, finds it, brings it in into the inventory of what you've seen so far within the orchestrator, and it goes through the configuration process. You do also have the ability to update or downgrade the actual versions of the software on these routers as well too, right? So we give you that flexibility within that process of the RMA. And what does this really do? So we look at shortening down those maintenance windows. So your branch offices, as you're out there waiting for a new router, um, by doing this RMA process, we can get those branch offices back up and running again pretty quickly, right? So you don't have to go in and start pushing templates, configure it, a lot of the stuff that we kind of showed you a little bit earlier. So with that, let me uh, go in into the RMA wizard demo. Uh, let me minimize this here. <clears throat> so what I'm currently showing you is a true SD-WAN environment that's out there and running. We got 67 appliances worldwide. This is um, an environment that our system engineers are on. Currently, I'm part of that as well too, and I currently have uh, these appliances on that particular network. So this is a live environment where if I do anything, I can really impact some of the other you know, tenants that I have out there in that environment. So what I'm gonna do is actually select my system that I need to RMA. This is my system right over here on this side. And I'm going to go into my support and I need the technical assistance. I need to RMA this particular appliance router here. And I apologize that it's showing this way. Um, this is due to the uh, dimensions of the screen, but it usually shows side by side. Um, as you can see, it recognizes the appliance to replace. It gives me the IP, the model number, the host name that it currently has, the serial number, and the actual software version. <clears throat> I know that I have an appliance already discovered because I powered it on, and it's part of my account name, and it's registered to me, and it actually comes up as one of my new appliances I want to bring in. Um, I do have other appliances. I know for a fact this is one of the only ones right now that's in there, but it also recognizes that it's the same type of appliance, the same model in the software version. So as a heads up, for us to do this RMA, they have to be identical appliances, right, to be able to accomplish this. So if it's an ECXS, 
it has to be an ECS. Uh, if it's an EC small, if it's an EC small, um, the, we'd actually be able to run this RMA process with you. Okay. So there's an assumption here that you've already shipped me a new device and now I'm just transferring everything over? Yep. So if that device is completely blown up and I can't do that, is there still knowledge in the database about question. what that device was? Yep, that's a very good question. So one of the things we do is we actually do an initial backup, right? So let me bring back to that. So when the appliances are on the actual infrastructure on your network here, um, we would always, one of the best practices we say is back up and have the actual configuration, right? So I do have a backup configuration of that. So if the actual appliance was already blown up and out of the way there, it would actually show grayed out, no connectivity or anything going on with it, but I could still select that particular appliance in it because I know it's still within that orchestrator mm -hmm. and then go through the same process at that point. And what it'll do is it'll just apply that configuration into this new appliance for you. That's a good question. Okay, now you mentioned configuration. Is that all we're talking about here too or is there also an element of security where maybe there was a certificate installed on that device and we're, we're RMAing it so we're gonna like deauthorize it so there's no way it could ever participate in my SD-WAN fabric again and this new device now inherits that authorization? So what we're gonna do is bring everything that you currently had before. Yeah. And it's gonna restore it just like the okay. other appliance that you had in there. So it's gonna be, and I'll show you the actual The file contents that we have in here, mm -hmm. this is actually everything that's going to get transferred and copied over into that configuration. I mean, everything as you have in there. And what happens to the other device, though, it gets now tagged as an RMA device. Yeah. So if it comes back again, it'll actually put it into the denied appliance. If yeah, so if, it, if for whatever reason it came back exactly. up on the wire, tried to join it, it no it, way it, it could do that. It just let it, yeah, yeah, at that point. It's already been taken and assumed that spot. Yeah. But yeah, so what you probably would do manually, we're actually now backing this information up for you so we can then apply it to the action of the appliance. And then here's where we actually say, are you actually updating any of the firmware you know, or the actual software on any of the appliances? We can do that as well through this as well. So we can downgrade it, we can upgrade it as well too, if you need it to. So what is so, the what is the minimum configuration in the in the device? So what these boxes would have what like Damon and Anusha were saying earlier today. They were talking about applying and having business intent overlays configured, ACLs associated to it, user accounts already built to it, and that's what the actual configuration is. So if I have certain policies in the other box already configured and I need to bring those over to this new box, that's actually the data that we're backing up in the configuration. No, I'm saying what, the minimum that you need to have when you replace the RMA, what is the minimum that you need to have? Nothing? You just plug in? Yeah, it's, uh, this, the only thing is that we need to make sure that that box is registered to you, which it should. It'll come up as an appliance discovery because it has the account name and key, but it's a blank box and it's not been configured, it's not been set up. Mm. Nothing to it at that point. And so what you guys are seeing right now is that it's going in process, it's shut down the other appliance that I currently had in here, and then it's migrating the information in the database for others. So you can see in the inventory how it's changing the name from what it had before. Now <coughs> it's bringing it in into the actual orchestrator in that case. So is it kind of the same process if you're just deploying devices where you're just, you, it's really zero touch provisioning, same idea, same process under the hood? It's kind of the same way, except with zero touch provision, you still have to go in and manually configure where it's located, the okay. password, all, all like in our case. Touch. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we have to go in and configure that. Now we do have something new coming out with zero touch, which we are able to do a lot more quicker by pushing out a file towards it, you know, and then you have all that pre-configured in there. So yeah. you don't have to go through that process. Mm -hmm. But it's just a little, it's kind of that way, but it's a little bit different. Yeah, we're lazy. Network yeah. engineers are lazy. <laughs> and uh, also it is necessary for the large scale environment anyway. For what? For large scale environment, oh, yeah. it is necessary. We are lazy, that's true. We are, well, especially if you have a lot of site turnups and DCOMs, you know, in, oh. a, in an organization where you have, uh, I did a project and, I, and it was a, a state agency with many hundreds of temporary sites around New York because they were the trailers, you know, for different projects. And we were spinning up and turning down sites constantly. Right. And they were 600, 800 series routers that we manually configured, and it was just a real, real pain. That's so for a, for a thing like that with four or 500 sites, 
which may not sound big to you, but the churn was so much that a, a solution like Silver Peak, which didn't exist at the time, yeah. would have been really, really awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Which I know is not the RMA process, so I, I sort of changed your I Yeah, that's more the deployment process. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, but it's, very, it's, but very, it's very similar concept. But it's very I similar. Think, yeah, the, the point is that the boxes ship from the factory with nothing, right? Yeah. Um, and, except for some version of software that's running on them. And as Alex mentioned earlier, they're associated to your account based on the serial number, right? Mm -hmm. So they plug in, they get a DHCP IP address, they phone home, we associate them via our cloud portal to your orchestrator. Then if it's a new deployment, you're going through that zero touch process, which is, okay, I'm gonna approve it, and maybe I do need to add in a few more things, sure. like I'm gonna add in its physical location or something like that. Um, that's about a four or five step wizard. And in this case with the RMA process, it's you know literally what Alex showed you, which is this box is exactly replacing that box. There's no other change I need to make. Copy everything over. Do I need to have always hardware? I'm sorry? Do I need to have hardware? No, you don't need to always have hardware. No, we, we, hardware makes it easy to understand, right, when you're talking about this. Yeah. But um, we ship uh, virtual versions of our software that runs on all the four common hypervisors and all the, all the cloud platforms out there. A lot of times when people think about SD-WAN, they're thinking about hundreds or thousands of branches, and especially with small locations, you often don't have the capability to have a server and a hypervisor and you know, um, a VMware admin there, right? So in those kind of environments, physical hardware is just a little bit simpler. Question, uh, one of the sticking points I've seen with shipping something to the field where there's no technical person there is the labeling on the interfaces. Mm -hmm. I'm not familiar with the labeling on your interfaces. Some vendors color code, some put um, ISP1, ISP2. Yeah. Do you have a blow up picture or? Uh, I, don't, I don't think we have a blow up picture right now. I guess, are you gonna unplug that? Yeah, and the give one it to that him? was off. Yeah. Give it to them. Yeah, so they're simply labeled with management zero, management one, yeah. LAN zero, LAN one, LAN zero. So assuming they can read. It, it does assume that they can read. <laughs> can we, can we Man, see as well? You give zero credit, credit to anyone on site. Well, actually I should have phrased that Assuming they can and will read, yeah. as opposed to blindly inserting cables. Right. Right. I believe when we ship these boxes, we have color coded. We do ship with color coded cables, um, mm -hmm. and nice. so you know, again, I mentioned earlier, you know, plan your work and work your plan, right? So once people are doing large deployments, they'll have the red cable goes into WAN zero, the blue cable goes into LAN one, whatever it may be. And then you have a yellow, uh, or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing I want to make note is that you know, since this is a live production environment. I currently have about 30 active sessions, like 30 individuals, you know, say RSCs logged in into this. So as I was doing this, you would notice that it only impacted my current site, my branch. I did not impact anybody else's as I was doing this, right? And as it's still updating, you know, still refreshing and doing some updates as well too. But I, I think that's also important to do so, to know about it because, um, you know, because something could really go wrong really quick. And this is anything we do here within orchestrators, a global, type of a setting as well, too. But, uh, you'd probably, especially in your larger branches, you'd be putting this in, t in the type of an active actor or active standby pair, right? Correct. Okay. Right. Yeah, absolutely. You know, any time that no downtime is the requirement, it's going to be an, an HA type NHA. configuration. Do they work as an active standby, or do, are you load balanced between e the two? Either active standby oh, you or can active, do active, okay. active, uh -huh. active, yeah. You can, you can do Yeah, I mean, and if you don't mind, I know, you know, I don't want to take away from you, but I think it's important for, you know, anybody maybe watching this that I've done this with a 35 site organization, so we don't need to always talk about 10,000 right. sites. That sounds really sexy to talk about, but... You know, when you're when you're working with like a 35 site organization, which is small, but they're all all over the world, but your company really is only 500 people, so you have two network people, you right. know, and they're not highly skilled. This is actually a really great solution. So even though it's a small number of sites, it still lends itself, and I, I, I it really worked for for a customer I had in that sense. So you know, I just wanted to throw that in there. I appreciate oh, that. Yeah, we we all talk about hundreds and thousands, but there's plenty yeah. of customers well, it does that sound good that, that have impressive. ten sites and, and benefit greatly from yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Really, once yeah. you've had more than a handful of sites. For them, you should sell actually with the higher price. <laughs> no? I, I, one, one of the other like things that. I want to point out is we, we sort of talked about restoring the config and we showed you the, the backup file, but it is a little bit more than that because it's, it's, you know, it's upgrading, downgrading the software, restoring the configuration of the box, but then it's also you know, adding it to the business intent overlays and getting it back functionally you know, onto the network. Where 
in, in the old style world, yeah, maybe you restored the config, but you still had to go and push your templates and you still had to go and change your NTP settings, whatever it may be. So all, all of that is fully automated. Yep. Now, you mentioned earlier about the RMA tool. Yeah. It's to be the same appliance that you're uh, yeah. going between. Yes. I'm looking at the chart of the different levels that you have of appliances yeah. for uh, bandwidth throughput, things like that. Say I'm upgrading hardware. Yeah. Is there a seamless way to move from one to the other? Yeah, so, so then you'd go back to the zero touch, the typical zero touch provisioning model, okay. which is you know, you'd ship out a new piece of hardware <coughs> to that site, you go into orchestrator, you decommission your old hardware, you'd approve your new hardware, and apply the business intent overlays. Okay. So that's, that, that's about a four or five step wizard as opposed to this one or two step gotcha. wizard. And you know, the reason we can't apply the RMA wizard when it's difficult physical boxes is you know, one may have six inter Ethernet interfaces, the other one has four. I mean, you know, yeah. there's, we, we could try to automate that, but we'd probably make a mistake. Gotcha. Um, so it's, yeah, the, the typical zero touch process is also still quick enough. Pr yeah. pr pretty quick enough, but for the RMA case where you know it's identical. And same, I, would it be the same going physical to VM? Yeah, so uh, physical to VM, you do the same thing where you uh, decommission the old one and spin up a new one. But again, go through the ZTP process. Cool. Yeah. The only thing with the, with the virtual machine is that there's no serial number. Mm -hmm. So in that case, it doesn't automatically get associated to your account. You got to go type in your account name and key. Oh, uh, okay. It's, yeah. it's, there's no hardware to tie it to, right? Yeah. But other than that, it's the same. So yeah, it's, it's just going through its update process. Just wanted to show you that. But that's really what I had for the demo for you guys. Yeah. Yeah, questions? You guys cool? When, when there is a failure, uh, and I don't have a cold standby, uh, Silver Peak just sends it to the site. So what, what, I guess some kind of contract, whatever service contract we have, right? That's so, right. Right, right. Oh. exactly. Yeah. Yeah, we've got a little over 20 global depots. Um, so we can get most places pretty, quick, uh, pretty, pretty quickly. Quick. Um, you know, there are some far-flung islands of the world that will take a little bit longer. Sure. But, um, we've, we've got most of it covered pretty well. And it, you know, it goes down to, I guess, what you were saying earlier, right? And that's the way I look at it. Either it's a mission-critical site, in which case you have to have HA, or you can wait a day right? yeah. and, and get it from our depot. Yeah, no, that, that was what we had hoped to cover today. Um, and I don't know if there are any additional questions. We're more than happy to. Uh, I think we have uh, 10 or 15 minutes left. Um, if there's something that um, we didn't cover that you have a question on, um, or if, uh, if there's anything else that we can cover for you, we, we're certainly happy to do it. Silver Peak's take on branch in a box and uh, your positioning there. Branch in a box, you want to take that one, Damon? Uh, yeah, branch in a box, I, I think is some terminology that other vendors may be throwing around. I mean, our view is, kind of as, we, as we covered a little bit earlier, for branch or retail store, um, Silver Peak can be the only appliance that you need there, right? We're just enough routing, just enough security, um, just enough WAN ops, and of course, all wrapped up in SD-WAN, and, and that, that's all you need. Now, that doesn't mean that's gonna work in your data center, obviously, but for, um, for a branch office or a retail store, yeah. Yeah, I think so. We got lots of customers doing it. The one thing that we find interesting there, um, for those that have truly embraced it, where they say, you know, I'm taking all my sites, and maybe, to Phil's point, maybe it's only 10 or 35, but maybe it's you know several hundred, and they're going SD-WAN, thin branch everywhere. We'll find a lot of them will uncover a few skeletons in the closet where that branch office had some equipment they didn't even know existed. So it's a good opportunity to spring clean, you know, when you go in and replace that that gear. You guys also mentioned WAN up, and you deployed a thousand customers now, right? Yes. So how many? How much uptake is there on on WAN up? That's a really good question. So um, we find about three quarters of the customer base takes some WAN up, and that's the key, right? Because you don't need WAN up for every application, and you don't need it in every location. So that's why it's a um, an optional click of a button on a you know maybe pure per region basis or per application basis. So, all right, seventy five percent of them are doing some, not not everywhere necessarily. When they deploy SD WAN, are you seeing some, you know, uh, less number of WAN optimization? Uh, are we seeing less WAN optimization as, yeah. as opposed to SD WAN? So yeah. Certainly, our business has switched almost entirely from our legacy WAN optimization business to our SD WAN business. 
Um, there are some existing customers that still purchase WAN optimization products, um, but everyone is on, every, certainly everybody new is on Edge Connect, and if they need WAN optimization, then they leverage the boost capability. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things um, on our customer base, um, so if you think there are a thousand customers that have deployed Edge Connect uh, today, 80% of those are brand new customers to Silver Peak. They weren't existing uh, WAN optimization customers. So, yeah. uh, and we're also seeing um, a, a growing uptake of customers deploying through our service provider partners that are using managed SD-WAN services too. So um, that number's growing uh, pretty rapidly now. I want to go back to the segmentation part of the conversation. We, we got all wrapped around the axle in the back channel trying to figure out what you guys meant by zone based and segmentation yeah. versus what we think of as VRFs, where yeah. within a device you've got unique routing tables. And so the question came yes. up um, what about overlapping address space? Are you guys actually, are we talking about separated routing tables where you could handle overlapping address space within uh, the Silver Peak appliance? So when we talk about zone based segmentation, it's more akin to what you think of in the typical zone based firewall. Yep. Right? It, it doesn't today support overlapping IP addresses, but that's currently un, in, in the works. Okay. Yep. Yep. It does get confusing because those terminologies can um, be applied to solving similar problems, right? Is the problem simply segmentation? And you could solve that problem by using the zone based firewall or the segments that we have in the Silver Peak solution, or by having a VRF type example, right? Mm -hmm. The other problem that you may have as a customer that you're addressing using VRFs is, you know, um, bank A acquires bank B and everyone's using 192, 168 IP addresses and then you have the problem of overlapping IPs and that's something we're working on, um, on solving okay. as well. What about uh, multicast? We yeah. didn't talk about it. Yeah, I didn't talk about multicast. That came up in a couple of, of network field days. Um, that's something that um, we we're hoping SD-WAN would eliminate the need for. You know, multicast is about, um, you know, delivering lo you know, lots of video streams efficiently to a branch office, right, and only having one copy go across the wide area network. But when you've got tons of bandwidth, do you really need multicast? Oh, wow, wow. Well, we come back to it. So, <laughs> you know, it, now we have 1,000 huh? branches, but just five of them is requiring, say, uh, IPTV traffic. <laughs> So in that case, why I am sending the traffic to, yeah. even if I have a lot of bandwidth, so other 995 branches, so multicast yeah. might be all. Yeah, so, um, you know, there's another way to look at that. There's many video applications that work over the internet that don't use multicast because they can't, right? Or so our initial, I'm coming, I'm going to get to the point in a sec. So our initial take was, I'm not sure multicast makes a ton of sense in an SD-WAN deployment when there's, when there's lots of available bandwidth. Now what we found um, deploying with all these customers is that there's some applications that absolutely require it. And yes. asking the network administrator to go to the person who's in charge of the CEO um, end of quarter video broadcast and saying, hey, change your application is a pretty challenging thing to have that person do. Yeah. And so we have implemented traditional multicast in the Silver Peak solution. Uh, it's, it's currently in beta in our current release of software, and that's where we are. What does that actually mean? PIM at the edge? PIM at sparse mode PIM. Okay. okay. Yeah. ASM, I think. I'm sorry? I think ASM, any source multicast. Uh, PIM sparse mode, you said, right? Yes, PIM sparse okay. mode, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Then what about IPv6? Uh, yeah. Support? IPv6 is fully supported in the product, yeah. Good. Yeah. Okay, you just said a lot. Um, yeah. So true feature parity? So yeah, WAN links can be IPv6. We can do yep. IPv6 on the LAN. All the policies that you were, that you had seen there um, are all available via IPv6. Control plane and data plane. Control plane and data plane. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. It's really, the world of IPv6. <laughs> we were joking about it the other day. Um, I'll, I'll, I will tell you about an exception in a second. But you know, everyone was talking about 2010 as being the, the year of IPv6, right? <laughs> that was a long time ago. Oh, and um, we, we had a customer in here yesterday and we were talking about IPv6 and um, it was one of their business goals to implement IPv6 in two of their sites this year. So mm. I'm just so used to not hearing that answer. So here's, here, here's a couple of the exceptions. We don't do um, uh, IPv6 for BGP and OSPF yet. So there's, uh, the, okay, that, so that'll give you an exception. Announcing to the LAN, you're not v supporting v that. V6 the, maybe yeah. with SD when uh, we can question with the SDUM, is do we really need it? But for the multicast, I couldn't say that. 
and uh, we were just discussing Tom and Ethan. So yeah, you can argue you don't need it with SD-WAN, but um, here's, here's another reason why I think IPv6 is very important. Certain parts of the world, for example, certain parts of Africa, Reg they can no longer get an IPv4 address. Yeah. Actually, right now, we cannot get from any RAR, any region in Tangier Registry, they don't give it. Yeah. Maybe uh, local RARs like ISPs can. You are right, but again, sd WAN is an overlay, and really, why do, you, do I need it? Yeah, on the LAN side, you don't necessarily need it, but we still have to have it on in that environment, right, where the service provider is not going to give you an IPv4 address, got to support it on the WAN.